What is going on to all my Spider-Man fans out there and welcome back to my channel Movie Files. As you all can see from the title of this video, this is a full spoiler review, discussion and breakdown of Spider-Man No Way Home. We're talking about the scenes that really worked for me, scenes that didn't work for me, those cameos, the ending, the post credit scenes, and of course I'm going to share with you all my predictions and theories of what I hope to see for Tom Holland Spider-Man in the MCU moving forward or maybe going over to the Sony Universe. We're breaking it all down here in this discussion, but before we dive into it, it, make sure you're checking me out on all my other social media accounts if you're new to the channel consider subscribing and hitting that notification bell and as you can see on the screen now if you enjoyed the review we'll make sure to like and share this video and also go ahead and leave your thoughts in the comments we're talking spoilers so what was your favorite moment what were moments that didn't work for you all what did you think about matt murdoch and aunt may's death and of course toby and andrew making their way into the mcu with that big moment let's talk about it all and of course share your predictions of what you hope to see for tom holland as Spider-Man in the future and let's talk about it all in the comment section so the way I want to handle this video like I do with all my spoiler reviews there's going to be topics there's going to be questions there's going to be deep discussions about this movie so I'm going to go ahead and leave time codes in the description below so with all that being said let's tackle the first topic which I want to ask you all out there so as we all know, the elephant in the room, the, the leaks, the speculations, the photos, all that stuff in the last year has really, for me personally, I can only speak for me, it, it's, it dampened my excitement a little bit for the film because it's like, oh man, I would have loved to have seen that moment or seen that character in the film for the first time. But obviously we live in an age now where it's almost impossible to not learn something about these big budget you know, Marvel films, Star Wars films, DC films, and even other films of leaking getting out there. It hasn't been, it's been, this is the worst I can ever imagine. This was the this film, uh, No Way Home, was the most leaks I've ever seen for a movie, and it's just I think some of that has to do with Sony. I think Sony kind of puts stuff out there, but that's another discussion for another day. But neither here nor there. My thing was, even though yes, we heard about Matt Murdock, we we heard about the rumors of Toby and Andrew, and I'm not condoning leaks, but I have to say for me personally, even with that knowledge prior to going to the film, it all for me it all depended on the execution, and I think the execution over weighed me knowing or potentially knowing what was going to happen, right? So I just want to know for you all, if you're kind of ears to the ground like I am when it comes to the Marvel stuff, the DC stuff, and you kind of saw the stuff out there, were you let down because you knew it was going to happen? Or when you sat down and actually saw those moments happen, it still kind of shocked you. You still had enjoyment of seeing those moments. Let's talk about that in the comments below. But Putting that aside, let's actually get into this recap. Let's break down this film, starting off with the opening. First and foremost, I can't think of another Marvel or say MCU film that picks up immediately after the events of Far From Home. The only two films that kind of come to mind, I think of Thor Ragnarok, where we get the post credit scene of Thor and, and Loki and Thanos' and ship coming in, and we get that scene immediately in uh, Infinity War, or at least we see the after effects of what Thanos did with the Asgardians. And then I think of Infinity War to Endgame. It's like a week between, you know, that film, the next film, but this one, and correct me if I'm wrong, this picks up immediately after the events of Far From Home where we see Peter Parker's been outed. Everyone knows his identity, and I love how we open the film with people immediately trying to cancel Peter Parker. The one girl's like, oh, Spider-Man, he touched me, he hit me, you know, as he's trying to save Mary Jane for the people harassing them, and just seeing that moment, I love that we see the consequences from Far From Home into this film, because for me, when I think of Homecoming, passing the the, the storylines from one film to the next going to uh, Far From Home, that Far From Home film for me was more of a ramifications of Peter Parker's journey from Infinity War and Endgame more so than it was from Homecoming. So I love that we see the effects and the consequences and the circumstances from Far From Home into No Way Home. So I kind of love that opening that we get with the film. As we see, Peter is reunited with, you know, he obviously gets MJ, Ned, and he gets Aunt May. They go uh, and try to, you know, escape and they're surrounded at this point in the film by the department of the damage control and i don't know if you all picked this up but the which by the way i'm a big succession fan so i love that stewie was in this film but we see that that lead officer tells them when you know we see tom holland say nick fury can vouch for me you know and far from home i was working with him he says nick fury has been off world for i don't know how long he says but it's interesting that it's it's knowledge that they know that nick fury's off world so I, again we all know nick fury we'll see him again in a 
Secret Invasion coming to Disney Plus. But I did not know that other people knew that he was in and out of the world. And again, the scrolls and him using them as an impersonation of him. So I thought that was a really interesting little tidbit. But neither here nor there, you know, they're under cussy. They're getting asked a question. Ned tells them more than he actually should. And they're interrogating them at the point. But at this point in the film, you know, we see that he needs to get a lawyer. He needs to get his name cleared. And that's where Matt Murdock comes into place, which we'll talk about that scene here in a second. But even with the charges being dropped, their lives are still affected, right? They're they're not getting into college and particularly MIT. So that's really kind of the, the big starting point for Peter Parker. Like, man, I really messed things up and I have to clear not only my name, but clear my friend's name. So I love that narrative. But let's play the rewind game. I don't want to skip over the fact Matt Murdock, I talked about it up top. Yes, there was speculation about Charlie Cox over a year ago once the, the rights from Netflix came back to the MCU and Marvel and Disney. And then literally a week before the film came out, Kevin Feige said that when Charlie, you know, when we see Daredevil again, he didn't say when when we're going to see him. And a lot of us knew it was going to be Spider-Man, but it was going to be Charlie Cox. And here we are, ladies and gentlemen, he is in the film. He is a lawyer that was suggested by Peter Parker. He has a scene where he catches the brick showing you his senses. I love that scene. But the question I have for you all is, what now for this character? You know, I am to safe to assume this is not the Netflix version of Charlie Cox, which was incredible. If you all have not seen Daredevil, the three seasons, it's worth the watch. It's an incredible show. But I am to assume that this is not that version. This is obviously, this is the J. Joda Jameson type of situation where you're going to bring in characters that have played the characters from other universes and they're going to re, you know, revise their role in the MCU. So I think this will be a completely different Charlie Cox version of Daredevil. And by the time this video is out, if you have seen Hawkeye episode four, Five. We also have Kingpin coming to the MCU, so I'm very excited about that. But the question I have for you all is, where will we see the character next? Will we see him in a She-Hulk series? Will he have his own solo film? Will he have his own TV series? It won't be a season four if it's you know if we're not gonna you know have canon for the Netflix show. So where do you all want to see Charlie Cox as Daredevil next? Let's talk about that in the comments. But before we kind of move on to the next part here in regards to the circumstances and him clearing his name. I personally think as far as just like my way of maybe introducing things, I would have loved to have seen more of that dilemma of, you know, obviously Spider-Man. He didn't go to trial. He obviously got the charges dropped. But I wish, and this is just me selfishly because I'm a big Daredevil fan and in particularly Charlie Cox, which, by the way, a little Easter egg. I don't know if you all have seen a 2003 Daredevil, but... John Favreau played his best friend Foggy and the fact that he's in that scene with Daredevil Charlie Cox is a pretty cool Easter egg but neither here nor there I wish we would have expanded upon that 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 knowledge and that kind of information because I again I love Charlie Cox I would have loved had seen more moments with him and who knows maybe there's some deleted scenes with him and who suggested Peter Parker to go to Charlie Cox and this is where my kind of writer hat comes on and being an MCU fan I thought it would have been cool if Peter Parker would have been looking for a lawyer the first person he goes to to is maybe recommended from the Hulk. Hey, Peter Parker, I hear you're in trouble. I have a a cousin who's a lawyer, aka, you know, Jennifer Walters, who will be playing She-Hulk. She says to Peter, oh, I'm a little busy. I can't do this right now. But hey, I have a friend that's a lawyer, aka Matt Murdock. So I thought that would have been cool. I know there would have been maybe too much to kind of flood in, but that could have been what a five, seven minute scene. If that, I would have loved that they would have killed two birds with one stone. Number one, you're introducing She-Hulk for the very first time in this big event film, which is going to get people excited to watch her show. And then number two, it obviously would have been maybe a connective tissue if we are to see Daredevil in a She-Hulk series, they've already kind of created some canon that they are aware of each other. So again, that's just me putting on a little hat right there. Let me go ahead and put my theory hat away for the moment, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Let me know if that scene would have been cool. But there's a lot of cool scenes in this movie. As we move forward, we see Peter again, since his friends are affected by MIT. He comes up with the idea that, man, I know a wizard or sorcerer that can maybe help me out. And this is where Peter consults with Doctor Strange. And he wants the cast a spell to have everyone forget that he's Peter Parker, or I should say that Peter Parker Spider-Man. But before we get this, this spell, which I'm not a fan of how the events of this film takes place, which we'll talk about here in a second. But we learn in this scene that um, Doctor Strange, Stephen Strange... He's no longer the Source of Supreme. That title has been given to Wong because obviously he was blipped five years ago. So Wong is the new Source of Supreme, which is pretty cool. It, it doesn't explain why he was in Shang-Chi and fighting Abomination. I don't know why he's doing that. As a Source of Supreme, you would think he has more things to worry about, but it does speak to the Shang-Chi post-credit scene. Why is Wong involved in that post-credit scene? Because he's a Source of Supreme, and of course he's going to be experimenting and exploring what are these 10 rings, what's the significance of them. 
problem? How would they interfere the multiverse? So I love that Wong is now in place, but I'm going to still need answers on why Wong was fighting Abomination in that film, Shang-Chi. But again, new title, we have Shang-Chi, uh, or I should say we have Wong being the new Sorcerer Supreme. But going back to the film here, they go in the basement. They pull off the spell, and again, my issues with the spell is I just feel like Doctor Strange, who is in Infinity War, if it's between me and the stones and picking your life, Tony Stark and Peter Parker, I'm going to do the stones. Obviously, we know what he chose, but I just feel like he would have had more fish to fry. I feel like he would have had better things to do and not have wanted to help Peter Parker in that moment. And the fact that Peter Parker disrupts him and it, and it opens the multiverse just seems very kind of lackadaisical, if you ask me, but... Putting that aside, I know that it happens in the comic books. They kind of remix a little bit in the comics, but I know it happens in the comics. But I don't know. I just wish that there was a, a different circumstance in how the multiverse was open in Spider-Man No Way Home. But again, of course, it's all about, if you think about Peter Parker as a character, it's always accidental, right? He's accidentally bit by a spider, and then it's the snowball effect after that. So again, it kind of makes sense that it just he has tough luck sometimes. So I'll just put my my grievances with that aside. But let me know how you all felt about how the and, and we saw in the trailer we all speculated that Doctor Strange, the evil version of Doctor Strange, which we'll talk about with post credit scene number two in that trailer. But let me know how you all feel about the events being taken down and being set forth with Peter Parker messing up the spell and opening up the multiverse. Let's talk about that in the comments. But after this event, Doctor Strange is obviously mad at Peter because he finds out that Peter didn't even call the MIT consultant to see if he could maybe change things. So he kicks him out and gives him the idea to, okay, maybe I should meet with the MIT lady and talk to her as Flash gives him the location because Flash wants to be best friends with him, which by the way, Flash Thompson... I love that actor Tony, but they that's that's a pretty wasted character if you ask me. I don't know if they can redeem that character a la Agent, you know, uh, uh, Venom and have him Thompson, Flash Thompson be that version of Venom, but I don't think that they have that. I don't think that, that actor, I don't think he can play that role, nor do I think he has the gravitas to play that role in regards to how the MCU has set him up so far. Another conversation for another day, but again, he gets the heads up. He tells Peter where he can find the MIT lady that she's going back to Boston and she's going to be on the highway. Peter meets her. He tries to, you know, give her his pitch. He's not prepared for, but he is prepared for war as his spidey senses come off. And this is a great moment here as Doc Ock comes into the moment. We've all seen the trailers a thousand times and dissected, and we've seen that bridge scene, and particularly a, a million times. But even seeing it in trailers, seeing it in TV spots, seeing it in teasers. It still lived up to the hype. It was such a great scene. I'm a big Doc Ock fan. He's he's not my favorite villain in the movies uh, uh, as far as live action. We'll talk about my favorite and who killed this movie in a little bit, literally. Uh, but, you know, seeing Doc Ock fighting our MCU Spider-Man, you know, tentacles on tentacles, the banter, the back and forth, the nanotech technology as we see Otto Octavius using it. And then obviously Peter uses it against him to deactivate his suit. All this stuff is fantastic. It's not my favorite fight sequence in the film, but it's definitely top three within the movie let me know what you all thought about that fight on the highway it doesn't hold the candle to spider-man 2's train fight but it's still a pretty good fight sequence but let me know what you all thought about that moment but it's in this moment here that we see peter at this point he saves the mit lady she says she's gonna help him get into school you know help obviously ned and mj get into school or at least put in a good word to help them out which we obviously know that helped at the end of the film but we think things are cool but in comes my personal favorite spider-man on screen villain so far and Green Goblin, Norman Osborn back. But before they fight, we see um, a man, Dr. Strange, he portals in Peter Parker. They put in Dr. Octavius in the prison cell, but also we learn that Dr. Strange has found a presence of another visitor, as he calls him, in the form of Lizard, which I would have loved to have maybe seen that scene, Dr. Strange versus Lizard, even though I'm not a Lizard fan of the Amazing Spider-Man film, nor am I a fan of him in this film, but I would have liked to have seen that scene. I wonder if that's a, maybe a deleted scene that we can see in the future Doctor Strange finding a lizard because he was he was scratched up so we know that it wasn't just an easy fight you know uh, so I would have loved to have seen that moment but he's putting them in the holding cell and this is where we get the whole Scooby Doo this shit I will say, and this was, I mentioned this in my non spoiler review, I was very conflicted of my thoughts on how Peter in this film 
and this is Peter Parker as a character, he never wants MJ, never wants his friends, never wants Aunt May to get into his business because he doesn't want them to get hurt. But in this moment, as Dr. Strange says, you know, let's capture all these other villains, these visitors, he says, I need help. And for like five seconds, I'm like, wait, is are they about to recruit the other Spider-Man this early in the film? But obviously he's recruiting his friends to help him out. But I'm like, if you don't want them to be involved, number one, you just help them try to get back in college and now you're throwing them back into the mix. I found that to be a contradiction of the character Peter Parker because he doesn't want them to be in harm. I get it that obviously Ned's the guy in the chair. He helped him in Homecoming. MJ stepped up in Far From Home and they both had a moment to shine this film. But I was just like, if you don't want them to get involved, why would you loop them into this situation and they're literally in the basement when the villains are like two feet away? I, I just found that to be a contradiction for my personal taste, but a little nitpick. It didn't destroy my you know overall thoughts of the film. I just thought it was a little bit of a contradiction from Peter Parker, but it's in the moment where, again, Strange tells him, okay, we're going to capture these other villains. We're going to get your friends involved in the situation. I'm going to give you a suit upgrade as he, at this point, he's wearing the black suit and he gives him his web slinger. He turns into a magical web slinger and now they're on a hunt for what they think is the green goblin and they get a little tag that they're they think the green goblin's in the woods but it ends up being jamie fox electro which i'm going to say it now i thought that jamie fox i'm glad that he a lot there's a lot of redemptions in this film and i thought that out of all the spider-man uh amazing spider-man characters it only obviously being him and the lizard i like this glow up for jamie fox they don't explain why he looks different from the films but i'm pretty sure jamie fox say hey I don't want to be blue in this film and I don't want to look like a, a geek in this film let me have a little bit of swag so we see that he definitely looks different from his films as Spider-Man is able to capture him with the help of Sandman which I love at first that Sandman was the Sandman from Spider-Man 3 that he's had a little bit of a redemption I didn't buy the fact that he was able to turn so quickly when he saw that Spider-Man capture Electro and he's like, wait, I don't trust anyone. It's like, well, two seconds ago, you were just helping him. I felt that that was a little bit rushed in regards to that switch of the turn of the character for Sandman, but let me know how you all felt about that. But it's in that moment at this point, They've captured Doc Ock, they have Electro, they have, you know, uh, the Lizard, and they're having the banter in the room and all that, and they're putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Oh, you died in this universe, and we've come here, which I still don't understand the the details of if they died, if, if, if they were pulled from the universe in that moment, they, di they didn't die. Wouldn't the Spider-Mans in that world, wouldn't their trajectory of their characters be different because they didn't actually die in that moment? They were taken out of their universe in that moment. I guess I'm I'm a you know a geek when it comes to the 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 whole multiverse and the the magic of it all. I'm really kind of I'm really in, intrigued to know how that moment affected that universe when they were taken out of their universe the moment before they died. I don't know. Let me know how you all kind of put that pieces to the puzzle together. But as we kind of move on, we see at this point and you know rest in peace to Aunt May. Now I'm an, a Norman Osborn makes his way to Feast where she's working at this point. Now obviously, the whole theme that we've gotten from Aunt May, who I do think Melissa Tomei was wasted as Aunt May in, this, in, in the franchise, but she gets more to do in this film as other characters do in this movie as well. I'm speaking of Ned and MJ. She's working for Feast. She's having a conversation with Norman. She feels bad for him, and she and my man Peter... He was willing to get the job done. He's saying, look, Aunt May, it's not my problem. It's not my issue, which I'm like, yes, Spider-Man. Yes, it is in your problem. But he has good heart. He has good intentions. And he gets a lot of that from Aunt May as she tells him, you got to help people out, Peter. This is where great power comes. She doesn't say that line, but obviously where great power comes great responsibility. She's like, do the good, do the right thing in her eyes, which unfortunately ended up getting her killed. But it's at this point that Peter now has the goal to help the villains, secure the villains, to get them back to their, their world before they die, for they can be, you know, redeem themselves. Again, I get all that stuff. I'm just like, Aunt May, couldn't you just shut your mouth? Because it, it, again, it ended up killing you, but in all obviously setting Peter on this path of redemption a little bit later in the film. But we see that obviously Dr. Strange, who is doing the right thing, listen, Peter, it's all good and well that you want to help them out, but they're villains. This is their fate. They have their battle in the mirror dimension as Peter takes the box, the magical box. I can't remember the actual technical name of the box, but he takes that. I love the fact that Peter, even when he was, uh, you know, taken out of his uh, actual form of his body, he's still able to have his spider senses to move that box around. But let's talk about the moment here, kind of a civil war moment, if you want to call it that. Doctor Strange versus Spider-Man. Now, I know 
this is a Spider-Man film, but I am I just have a hard time believing, and they didn't fight to the death, obviously. They were not trying to hurt each other, but I just have a hard time believing that Spider-Man could beat Doctor Strange in a one-on-one sparring match, if you want to call it that. But it's his film. He's the lead. He's the one on the marquee on the name. He does get the best of Doctor Strange, which, uh, uh, okay, if you all know me, you know I'm not the biggest Doctor Strange fan, and this doesn't help him in my eyes in regards to having Spider-Man outsmart Doctor Strange in the mirror dimension of all places. He takes his ring. He traps him. He again. He outwits Doctor Strange, who has a million master degrees, and he uses you know math to <laughs> to beat Doctor Strange. He locks him in the mirror dimension. He takes the box. He takes that sling ring and gives it to Ned. Now let's have the conversation about Ned. I don't want to nitpick this film to the to the umpty degree, but I wish that they would have established that Ned had some magic. They do say it in the film when he meets Doctor Strange for the first time. You know, my Nana says that we have magic in our family. All that they 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 try to establish that that storyline in this film, but I think you know obviously hindsight swing twenty. They should have maybe had, and I don't know if this was the the end game when they were writing Homecoming and Far From Home, that, hey, Ned's going to be the one that's going to have magic and get the other Spider-Man into this universe. I, I doubt that those conversations were being had back then, but if they were being had, I think it would have been cool if Ned would have showed some type of magical interest in Homecoming, whether he was doing magic tricks, whether in Infinity War when t- uh, Tom is like, hey, can you distract them? He's like, hey, guys, you want to see a magic trick? I would have loved that they would have maybe established that Ned has some type of interest in magic instead of for just introducing it for the very first time in this film because he's my man Dr. Strange spent weeks months I don't know how long in his film when he was trying to open up portals but Ned's able to figure it out Uh, I guess that's the trajectory of the character when we see him next he's going to maybe be a sorcerer in the future I don't know again I don't want to nitpick but let me know what you all think about Ned having magical abilities out of nowhere right but anyway we move forward in this point Peter Parker takes the villains to Happy's condo, which just looks so weird to see Sandman, Electro, Doc Ock, you know, Norman Osborn, and Spider Man and Aunt May in a condo. It was just a weird aesthetic to see those characters in one room, but neither here nor there. Peter comes with the idea to use the device that Tony Stark gave him in Far From Home to make a suit, and now this device can cure anything, which I'm just like, well, if it can cure anything, wouldn't it be nice if Bruce Banner would have known about this device many years ago? But Putting that aside, they find out all the different ways to fix the villains. In particular, they start off with Doc Ock. They fix his chip. He's now, the voices in his head has gone away. You know, they, they get the arc reactor to help Electro. They're going to have a device to fix uh, a green, uh, the Green Goblin and obviously fix Sandman and, and all that stuff. And all the stuff was working out. But at the end of the day, you know, Norman Osborn is in the building and he kind of manipulates the situation. This is where everyone kind of splits up at this point. Doc Ock is blown out of the window by Electro and everyone's now fending for themselves right but i don't want to ignore this moment here i think this is the best fight sequence in the you know spider-man mcu you know movies thus far green goblin versus peter parker spider-man it was so vicious to see my man norman osborne who is my personal favorite villain in the entire live action version of spider-man him fighting peter parker and him giving him those hands body slamming him through the floor just the brutality and the nature and just seeing peter just he, he can't win he can't win this fight that's one of two rounds we'll talk about round two a little bit later but that was my favorite fight sequence in the entire film let me know what you all thought about that but oh green goblin he was the goat in this film and he's my he, he almost stole the film tom holland was great when it comes to the villains no one was close to norman osborn uh you know green goblin he was fantastic in this movie and that fight was incredible to say the least but we see unfortunately throughout this battle this is where aunt may meets her death right we see that she you know failed the green goblin throws the the goblin bomb she hits i, I believe she probably had a hemorrhage she hit her head or hit you know hit the concrete so hard having that moment was was very emotional uh, because that was the, the Uncle Ben moment that Toby had, that Andrew had, with great power come great responsibility. And to me, I don't know, let me know in the comments wh- which was more emotional for you, for Peter Parker. The moment when he's talking to Iron Man, I don't feel good, Mr. Stark, and he's dusted away. Or was it the moment when he's talking to Aunt May? He's like, come on, Aunt May, open your eyes. Don't do this to me. I'm kind of torn right now. I don't want to be biased because it's, you know, recency bias, uh, bias. seeing the, the film recently. I think that emotional moment with Aunt May hit me more than the in-game moment, which I, or I should say the Infinity War moment, which I cried in that moment as well. That was a good moment, man. It, it really kind of, number one, 
the maturity level is that's when spider boy if you want to call it tom holland that he became a man at that point because he had to make choices and this is the path that he's has to go on for the rest of the film he has that rage this is where the rage is implemented into tom holland he obviously has his redemption at the end and doesn't kill green goblin which we'll talk about but he still has gone he's still going to have that weight inside of him he's still going to have that rage inside of him which may speak to my theories a little bit later about that symbiote being left in his universe. But let me know how you all felt about Aunt May's uh, death. Again, it was rumored, it was speculated, it was leaked that she was going to probably die, but still, I thought the execution was handled perfectly. It was a very well-earned emotional moment, even though I feel like Melissa Tomei, homecoming, far from home, she was cool, you know, it was good to have her, uh, but I still feel like there wasn't that that Aunt May relationship that we got from even Mark Webb's version, or of course, you know, obviously Tobey Maguire's version, but I, I do think even with the wasted talent of Mr. Tomei in those two previous films, they stuck the landing in that moment, but again, share your thoughts of the death of Aunt May, we move on to Ned and Mary Jane, they obviously have heard, heard the news that Aunt May has died, and this is again, Magic Ned, he wants to find uh, their Peter Parker and try to help him out, because they're obviously best friends, and obviously that's Peter's girlfriend, he summons Peter Parker, and it's no other than Andrew Garfield, and let me tell you right now, I, I didn't mention it in my non-spoiler review, but I hinted at, there's a portion of the movie that I didn't even mention, but I was like, I absolutely loved it, this is the moment, the film was going great, I do think that the second half and third half are the strongest points of the movie, the first half was fun, again, the, the circumstances far from home, but once Andrew Garfield, and I should say, actually, when Green Goblin got in the movie, that's when the movie really kind of found its uh, momentum and found its footing, but when Andrew Garfield, and then fast forward and him picking the spider web, showing MJ that he really is a Spider Man, that stuff was hilarious. And then you bring in, or for a lot of people, the GOAT, Tobey Maguire's Spider Man, and seeing him and Andrew Garfield, you know, webbing each other, having their dialogue, having that moment was cinematic history. This is something that just even, I don't want to say even more, more impactful than Infinity War and Endgame, because that's like 10 years of like movie watching, continuously watching films, where obviously, you know, Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire was almost 20 years ago, uh, you know, Andrew Garfield was more than seven years ago, it wasn't a continuing, like it wasn't, their films, and we never would have imagined this was going to lead up to No Way Home, but in Infinity War, we knew we've been waiting since 2012 for these characters to come together to fight Thanos, so I don't think it's as impactful, at least for me, but it's still incredible to see two different Spider-Man from two different franchises within, obviously, the Sony umbrella coming to the MCU. I don't know if you all have been in this geekdom game for a while, but I remember watching Collider and watching all the stuff back in the day and just hearing all them saying there will never be a day in hell. It will be a frozen day in hell before Spider-Man comes to the MCU, before X-Men comes to the MCU, Fantastic Four. And the fact that we get Tobey Maguire, to Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland all in one film. <sighs> it just blows my mind. It is something that I don't think we'll ever see uh, again in regards to the significance of that. I will say, because I'm a Batman fan, it's going to be pretty cool and flash to see Michael Keaton, Ben Affleck, and maybe other Batman in their films. But putting that aside, it was a fantastic cinematic history moment. Let me know what you all thought about Peter Parker's coming into the MCU, meeting Tom Holland, but then they don't even just give us that one moment of them being introduced. They give us several other emotional moments. When we see Peter 1, Peter 2, Peter 3 talking to Peter Parker, Tom Holland in regards to loss, sacrifice, being a hero, one of the best scenes in the MCU, one of the best comic book scenes ever, in my opinion. I'm not saying it's the best, but it's definitely in the conversation. Just having them talk to him about their pain, how they lost Aunt May, how Andrew lost you know, Gwen Stacy was such a great earned emotional moment. Another example of how they're aging up our MCU Tom Holland to hear those stories was such a great moment and then to have them being the the smarter you know the nerdy scientist peter parkers them coming up with the serum the joke by the way by andrew to toby about looking like a uh, a cool uh, summer pastor or whatever he said was hilarious but them you know peter and then ned saying hey peter and all that it was just I, I felt like a kid again just seeing that moment i felt like i was watching a cartoon i felt like i was just 
in, in a nostalgia moment. It was just such a great moment to see those scenes play out. And I felt like Toby and Andrew, they didn't miss a beat. Of course, they're older. They're a little bit, you know, they're not as as, as in, in shape as they were when they're films. But I, I, I didn't even care. It was just seeing them, especially uh, not dismissing Toby. I thought he was fantastic in this film. But I really thought that Andrew was just so great seeing him back. And, and again, Toby was fantastic. Again, I talked about Tom being great. But it was so cool to see Andrew because I always had, even though I'm not a big fan of his films, I always like liked him as a Spider-Man, more so Spider-Man than Peter Parker. But just seeing him talking about how he, you know, feels so bad that he didn't get his third film, how he was, you know, grew up a Spider-Man fan. I just thought that it was so great that he was able to have those moments in the screen. And he definitely took advantage of it. But wrapping up the third act of the film, they're all going to team up. They go to, they come up with a plan, you know, the whole crack my back joke and the whole, you know, organic uh, web versus the engineer webs, all that stuff was fantastic. But seeing them work together, Tom saying, hey, you know, I know we're not a team, but I used to be on a team as the Avengers and seeing all that banter, but them coming together, fighting together, webbing together, taking out the, the villains one by one, you know, helping out. I love that we get the moment with Andrew and, and Jamie Foxx about him, you know, him helping them out and one of the greatest lines of this year man, helping out poor people, I thought you were black, and, and you know, it's like, oh yeah, that does suck, I'm not black, as he says, but he does say there's got to be a black Spider-Man somewhere out there, alluding to Miles Morales there, but I love that moment, I love the moment that Toby has with, obviously, Sandman, but also the moment he has with Doc Ock, regarding him being an older man, and him holding the sun in his hands, but then all of that is taken away when we see MJ falls, which, by the way, at this point, Ned brings in Doctor Strange from the 12 hour of being locked in the, in the mirror dimension but we see MJ falling off the right off the um, the tower and a lot of people alluded that it would be great to get Andrew to save her which he inevitably does save her which was a great moment and he says are you okay he starts tearing up and I think we can all it's safe to say we were all tearing up at that moment because we know what that moment means but in comes the goat Mr. Green Goblin comes in and this is another visceral fight him and Tom Holland and Tom Holland actually throwing hands throwing punches landing punches we see, you know, he has a glider. He's about to kill the Green Goblin, but Tobey Maguire comes in, has that moment, and I thought for about two seconds when Green Goblin stabs Andrew, or I should say stabs Toby in the back, I'm like, oh, damn, they're about to kill my man Toby in this film, which I do think that they held that moment. I think that they... I don't want to see Toby die, obviously, especially if it's not in his own movie, but I, I I, almost wish that they would have killed him because it would have been like, damn, this is like, this is really the end game of, of Spider-Man movies, but he says he's been stabbed before. They end up, Peter has his redemption. He doesn't kill Green Goblin. He stabs him, meaning that he clears him of his, of his sickness, of his, you know, split personality, and we have the moment where we see, obviously, at this point, the, the, the magical box has been exploded, and they have to stop these, you know, other villains coming in, which, by the way, I to see the film again, but I saw a silhouette of when the other Spider-Man villains were coming in. I could have sworn I saw Craven the Hunter. I could have sworn I saw Rhino. Um, I think I saw Scorpion, and there's probably other silhouettes that we, you know, that people can probably dissect. Once I see it again, I'll be able to maybe, once I own it, I'll be able to pause it and see who exactly they were alluding to. But we see Andrew, or I should say, we see Tom make the ultimate sacrifice, which that's all Spider-Man does. It's all about sacrifice. He says, the best way we can do is just everyone has to forget that I am Spider-Man, that Peter Parker is connected to Spider-Man. He says his goodbye to MJ, which is a great moment. Come find us. Let me know where you are and all that stuff. Great moment there as we wrap up the film. Everyone forgets who he is. What a moment of Peter going to visit his Aunt May's grave, seeing Happy and talking to him and having that discussion. And then you talk about emotional moments here. And by the way, when the Peter Parkers say goodbye to each other, that was a great moment. Will we see them again in the future? I guess time will only tell. I would love to see them again, but hey, we at least see them once on screen. But we wrap the film up with Tom going to keep his promise. He visits, you know, uh, MJ and Ned at the coffee shop, which... I don't know if they were alluding that MJ and Ned were a couple or were a thing, but putting that aside, they're both accepted to MIT. You know, we see Tom is practicing his lines, uh, Peter to MJ, and then he notices that she has a scratch on her eye, and that's when he notices, or he says to himself, I can't do it. I can't get them wrapped up in my mess anymore. I have to move on, which opens the door to MJ and Ned. Again, will they be a couple? They're going to be in Boston. Will Gwen Stacy now be his new love interest? Will he try to win her back? 
We'll see what comes of that. But just living in the moment, that was a sad moment because, again, it's all about sacrifice. And just thinking of Peter Parker in that moment, he has nobody. He doesn't have Tony Stark anymore. He doesn't have Aunt May. He doesn't have Happy. He doesn't have his best friends. He doesn't even have Doctor Strange or the two new Spider-Man best friends that he's made. He doesn't have anyone at this point, which is such a Spider-Man theme to see in this film, to see Tom Holland execute that, to see, which I'm not the biggest John Watts fan because I don't think he has a, a, a distinct voice in these films, but just to have him implement that moment to Peter Parker was a lot, meant a lot to me. Wrapping up the film, we see Peter Parker. We see the Peter Parker grown man. He moves into an apartment, which I would have loved that they would have brought the the um, the landlord from Tobey Maguire's world as a landlord here. But he has his own apartment. He's looking at the police scanner. He makes his own suit, which is more the classical look of the suit, which he gliding through New York at, at nighttime, alluding to him now being on this path by himself to create his own path as a man, as Spider-Man, which is a great way to end the film. So let me know how you all feel about the ending because number one to me it speaks to okay this is the marvel mcu and sony saying if if we want this is a way to write out spider-man because no one knows that he is spider-man peter parker in the mcu anymore i don't know how that how he's going to make his way to the sony universe because we're going to get to the post credit scene here in a second but what would you all want? Do you want to see him continue in the MCU? You put my money on it. Yes, I want to see that. Or do you want to see him go into the Sony universe with Morbius and Venom and Kraven and all the different stuff that they're building over there? Let me know how you all interpret that ending. I just think right now it's kind of, it's open-ended. Marvel and Sony, they can use each other and have Spider-Man because I think the owner or the CEO of, of Sony on the red carpet said that there will be one more, at least guaranteed one more MCU version or to say appearance of spider-man in the mcu probably dr strange makes more sense as far as the like the logical next progression of the character uh or um you know i'm trying to think of the next film that would make i mean obviously it can be an avengers movie but i don't think they're going to wait that long but uh, but if if i were a betting man i think the next time we'll see tom holland in the mcu will be in dr strange's film but let me know what you all speculate on that but what a fantastic ending what an emotional earned ending uh but let's get on to these mid credit scenes the first one here if you all know me, you know I'm not, I'm not a Venom fan. Um, I'm not a fan of, I love Tom Hardy. I just don't think that he is the Eddie Brock that I would like to see. Putting my thoughts on that aside, Eddie Brock is at the bar. He's talking to the bartender about the MCU stuff, you know, Thanos, Iron Man, all the different, the Hulk and all that. And then he, obviously the, the Doctor Strange spell takes place. He's brought back into his universe, which I'm like, thank goodness, because I want to see another version of Eddie Brock. But but him being in the MCU was a, a very short stint. But neither here nor there we see and and, and, and it's so interesting because they establish this and uh, let there be carnage that the symbiote has been around the multiverse that they have knowledge of the multiverse so the symbiote is in the MCU and we know that Venom has seen Spider-Man when he was in his post credit scene so I would assume that they're in Mexico that symbiote's going to make its way to Spider-Man, alluding to getting into the conversation about the future of Spider-Man. I think it's safe to say that the next time we'll see Spider-Man 4, he's going to have that black suit. He's going to have that rage still inside of him from the death of Aunt May and being lonely, being by himself. And that will be a, a storyline that I really look forward to seeing Tom exploring that more darker side, the rage side. It's a great way to introduce a, and again, no disrespect because I love Tom Hardy. He's Bane is my guy. And, and obviously Tom Hardy is an actor is a great actor but I just don't like that version of Eddie Brock goofy lonely silly weird version that the Sony has created I know there's fans of that I don't mean to you know poo poo on you guys' uh, Venom but I'm not a fan of Sony's Venom I am excited for Kevin Feige to bring in a more comic book accurate if you want to call it that version of Eddie Brock especially with now Spider-Man being an adult he's going to be looking for a job and they can set the seeds for him having that rivalry with an Eddie Brock uh, in a Spider-Man 4 so I think that that's something to look forward to and especially when you consider the first time we saw Venom on the big screen was in Spider-Man 3, they established all of that in one film. Now we get the seeds planted in this post credit scene to open the door up for Spider-Man 4. So let me know if we're on the same wavelength, if you all think that that's the next progression for the character in Spider-Man 4 and what that can mean in that post credit scene. Let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. And then, of course, the second post credit scene was the trailer for Doctor Strange into the Multiverse of Madness. I'll probably have a deeper conversation with that at a later point because although it's not official 
officially out there yet in regards to the trailer, but the trailer was great. You know, the biggest thing that I took away from the trailer is Wanda looks incredible. Uh, you know, again, Sorcerer Supreme Wong. We got Cheetah Chill as your four back and got the dreads looking badass as always. And then we have the what if version. I'm, I'm, I think that that is the what if version of Doctor Strange, the, the Supreme Strange. I think that he is, and I think there's a little bit of trailer trickery because right now, from what I understand from the film, Wanda will be the villain in the film. And I think the way the trailer portrayed it is, we see him says, you know, the evil version of Doctor Strange, I've made mistakes or I messed up or something of the nature. I think they're going to team up to go against Wanda because I am, again, I think that that is what if version of Doctor Strange. We know from the finale of what if he's having a redemption story. So I think he's going to want to help help this multiverse you know he's going to help this universe because he was able he destroyed his so i think he's going to have a redemption story and i think supreme strange doctor strange you know uh chavez american chavez will work together wong to take on wanda and there might be an even bigger villain at the end of the day that they have to team up against so i'm really excited for that even though i'm not the biggest doctor strange fan uh, i'm really excited to see sam raimi direct that film and, and bring a lot of greatness to the mcu so there you have it, guys. We broke down the film. I talked about the stuff that worked for me, didn't work for me, uh, the appearances, the, the the leaks. We had a lot of great discussions in this video, and I'm so uh, happy I was able to do this for you all. Again, 40-plus uh, minute discussion. I always love geeking out with you all. So if you stuck to the, stuck onto this point in the video, I appreciate you. Before you leave, make sure to like the video, share the video, leave your thoughts in the comments, predictions, theories, what worked, what didn't work. Let's have a discussion about it in the comment section. I hope that I'm able to make it work but i'm hoping to have a spoiler discussion a live discussion this coming sunday which i believe is december 19th little in the probably a little bit after the afternoon maybe an evening uh, stream with myself and hopefully some other avengers to talk about this film so keep an eye out for that but again i appreciate every single one of you all as you can see on the screen now subscribe to my channel check out my other content we'll catch you on the next video